Hi there, and welcome to my new channel. This channel is mostly going to be about things like 3D printing, but it'll probably cover a few other things as well. And certainly, as I'm most familiar with Blender, I'll be using this for all of my modeling and so on. Those of you who've subscribed to my other channel, you will be used to this format where I will take us through demonstrating how to do certain things within Blender. But I'm going to take this one step further and I'm going to go on to follow on programs such as MakerWare or RepG and then actually have some real film where you see the object being printed and any processes that are necessary after that. This is going to be slightly different in terms of the Blender element to my usual tutorials in that rather than just quickly showing you how I've already done something, I'm actually going to design and build something from scratch. So I may have to fast forward or cut out bits of it in order to not make this tutorial too long, but I'm going to try and keep it fairly simple so that it doesn't take too much time. So my idea is that we'll create a very simple pen and pencil holder and I'll apply some slightly interesting texture to it rather than just a plain cylinder. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that dimensionally what we're making makes sense because that can affect other things that we do. So if we're using Blender, obviously if you're using other tools then this section isn't too interesting for you. But under Blender I need to make sure I'm set to a measurement system. I like to use metric and the scale is 0 0.001 to help things map one to one with the other software that I'm going to be using. So now one millimeter in Blender equates to one millimeter in the real world approximately. So I'm going to add a simple mesh circle. Because we are working on a quite a small scale I'm going to now scale it by 0 0.1 and in fact 0 0.1 again. So we've got the basis of our shape. If I press N and bring up the menu on the right hand side you can see under dimensions that currently our circle is approximately two centimeters across which is a bit small for a pen. I think we'll go for something about six centimeters across. So we'll scale by three so now our XY is six. We'll go into orthographic view and one interesting thing you may just be able to make out the blender units and we can see one two three four five six so each of these squares at the current scale equates to a centimeter and if we zoom in we can see smaller squares which obviously equate to millimeters so i think i want this about 10 centimeters high so to begin with i'll go into edit mode extrude and bring this up to 10 centimeters so you can see we're roughly 10 centimeters there and if we need to be precise, I can obviously narrow that down. Now, a little bit about the Blender tools. If I look from the top, I can look here under dimensions, but obviously sometimes your shape isn't symmetrical and you need to measure some subset of it. In Blender, if you come down to Grease Pencil, there's a ruler in here that we can use when we're not in edit mode. In fact, we can use it in edit mode as well. And I can measure from there over to there, and you can see it's six centimeters. Press escape to come out of it. So that's got a very basic cube. What I didn't do is add additional vertices to the circle. So I'm going to be adding a subsurf in a minute. But before we do that, what I want to do is obviously add a bottom to this. So obviously the most basic thing is simply to fill that bottom shape. But because I'm going to be adding a subsurf, I want to do more than that. So I press E to extrude, left click, scale in a little, and then E to extrude, left click, and then Alt M and say merge at center. So we've got an extra ring of vertices there and go into edit mode again, control R, use the mouse wheel and create two vertices around the edge there and then scale on the Z axis to about there. And this again is to do with the subsurf but it's also for another element of the exercise. If we have a look at that. So I'm going to add a subdivision surface modifier now and we'll make that at least two. I tend to use fairly high subsurf modifiers because you can see we're only up to two and a half thousand vertices but I want to make this as smooth as I can. So we're going to put another level on so we're up to three and if we look closely we can see we've got a little bit of curvature. Now curved parts will tend to have a bit of an issue where they meet the build plate because obviously if we zoom right in just here it's coming away from the build plate but there's nothing supporting it. Now we can support it, we can add support material, then obviously you've got to remove that. So generally try to minimize this. This is actually quite small, so it's probably going to only going to be a layer or two and then it'll be into the vertical, depending on what resolution we print at. So that looks quite smooth. I haven't gone to smooth shading. You can use smooth shading, especially if you're planning to smooth the object afterward by some means, sanding or whatever. But I like to not use smooth shading so that I can see what's going on with the faces. So I'm actually going to apply that subdivision surface in a minute. But before I do, I need to give this some thickness. Because it's such a simple shape, I can just use solidify modifier. 
it's more complex shape, I'd have to select this ring of vertices and create a new set that goes down inside. Because it's very simple, I hopefully shouldn't need to do that. So I'm going to add the solidify modifier. Now at the moment, you can see it's set to 10 microns, which is way too small. So for a container, you certainly don't want to be less than a millimeter. I'm going to go for two millimeters and actually put millimeters in. Now, if we look down at the top, or just off the top, we can see that doesn't look quite right. The reason is because we haven't applied scale. So I'll make sure that rim is in view, control A, rotation and scale, and now all of a sudden it works. And that's another example of where you need to work to the correct scale and you need to make sure you apply scale whenever you scale an object. Because if you don't do that, Blender's just working off a multiplier. Its modifiers don't really know how big your object is. But now we can see it in context and we can see what two millimeters is going to look like. And I think that'll be all right. So I'm actually going to apply that modifier. If I put this one above the subsurf modifier, that'll actually give me a curved edge, as you can see. And I might prefer that. I can just play with this just to determine which way around I want it. If I'm going to have a curved edge, I'm just going to turn off the subsurf modifier a minute. So I think I am going to go with a curved edge because I think it looks nicer. And it means we'll get a little bit of a curve in there as well. So I'm going to apply both the subdivision surface and the solidify modifier. Notice that with the solidify modifier, if I turn this off, you can see the object isn't getting any bigger, so it's growing inward at the moment. If I set this to minus two millimeters, you can see it grows outward. And I'll go with that, I think. We can actually measure that. Six centimeters. So we can see that because we've grown it outward now, it was six centimeters on the inside depending on where you measure it now that we've got a curved surface and then it's got an extra two millimeters of thickness. So we've got our container. Now we need to make it a little bit more interesting. We could put text on there, but I thought what I would do is actually put a texture on the surface. I need lots of vertices for this. And as you can see, there aren't very many there at the moment. So to begin with, I'm just going to apply the solidify modifier and then apply the subdivision surface. And now we can see there are a lot more vertices. Not necessarily enough for my purposes. So in edit mode, in wireframe mode, I'm going to select this area. Come out of wireframe mode, go to face select mode, and I'm going to unselect the internal faces. So I had Alt Shift selected and was right clicking on the edge of a face. Now, just because it will make it easier to reselect these faces if I need to, and I think I will select one more ring of faces down here, I'm actually going to apply a material. I'm going to say another new material because the other one's the base material. And I'll give it a color, which is just a color in the viewport, and assign it. And this is just really to make selecting this easier in future. And this is really just so that I can see where my material is going to go. So what I'm now going to do, bring up a new window. And I'm going to UV unwrap against the cylinder projection, those selected faces. So it came out very large. So you can see that's not ideal. Problem is that there's no seam at the moment. So I need to add a seam. So I selected a vertex ring but you can see because of the way I've created the middle it's gone in and come back out again but I don't need that seam on the inside anyway so I'm going to deselect this area I don't really need a seam up there either and there so I've now just got a line selected there so control E mark seam so we'll select our material again U cylinder projection so that's looking a little better and we've got a more sensible mapping there and just doing a basic unwrap gives us a pretty good unwrap as well. And I think we'll go with that. It's not perfect. Ideally, those lines should be straight. And we could go in and straighten those lines. But let's see how we get on. So I'm just going to scale it up a little bit on the Y for a moment, just so we can see it easier. And now we're ready to bring in a material. Now, I'm not obviously going to apply this material as I would in a render, because that's not what we're doing. I just need to make sure that the mapping of the material is right. So I'm going to open my textures. And I've got a tileable wall here. And I'm going to use this one that I call DISP because it's basically a much higher contrast version of the wall. And you can see that's mapped across fairly well. We, as I say, we may, I may need to straighten these up, but we'll see what it looks like. The main thing is what it's going to look like at the seam. And I may need to wrap the wall around to help eradicate the seam. We may not yet have enough vertices in here. So what I'm now going to do is just add a few more loops where I need them. Okay, so we're ready to put a texture on it now. So we'll come over to the modifiers 
and we'll add a displace modifier. We need to say new texture, you can see it's already done something there, and then we click these little buttons to go over to the texture options and select image. The image I want is my old wall, and then come back to the modifier and we'll tell it to use the UV map. And now you can see, although the image is still relatively low resolution, it's starting to work. So I'm now gonna add another subdivision surface modifier, but I'm gonna put that above the displacement modifier. And again, you can see the wall text is starting to come through now, but it's still pretty crude and the strength is probably a bit too much. So I'm gonna put this down to 0.5 for a moment. And then what I'm gonna do is have a play with the mapping. So go to the materials and we'll select that material, but there's too many parts of the wall in the image. So I'm gonna scale this down. Actually playing with a lot of vertices now, so things are slowing down a bit. And now you can see we're starting to get that wall sort of texture. And that's a real geometry. Once it's printed, it's not just an artifact of rendering or anything like that, although we won't get the green, obviously. So we're up to half a million faces, which is getting to be quite a lot. So what I'm gonna do, I think, is I will put the subdivisions down to one, go into edit mode. I've got all of these faces selected, press W and subdivide. So that's only increased the number of faces on this selected area, but we've still got the subdivision surface on. And now you can see that's looking better. Now we will have a seam somewhere in here, and there it is. And that's really something I'd like to deal with if I can. So if I go back to edit mode and come into here, there's obviously a lot of vertices here now. So everything's starting to slow down a bit. So I'm going to select approximately half of it. I'm going to turn off the subdivision surface for a minute and the displacement modifier. And now what I'm gonna do is scale on the X minus one and then G to move this set of faces over to this side. And I obviously need to distort it slightly. I think I'm gonna move it over here for a moment so that I can reselect it easily. And then I'm going to select this end proportional editing and press scale on the Y just to take that in a little bit. Select all the faces again and bring them over. So it's just getting it near enough that it isn't noticeable. So turn my subsurf back on, turn my displacement modifier back on. There's still a bit of a line there. And this is one tricky bit of doing things this way. You can't really see what you're doing while you're doing it. You have to move it around a little bit and then take a look. And that's not too bad, bearing in mind that these little bits probably won't even print out. And you can see why they're there because these parts aren't aligning properly. And for this exercise, I think that will be good enough. So we can close that window now and we can have a look at what we've got here. So we're up to almost a million faces. That might be too many, but I'll drop it down and there we are down to quarter of a million faces. That should be fine to print. And we're really ready to go now. I found you don't actually need to apply the modifiers when you create the STL file, which is the file we need to send to our printer program, the slicer, so, which is handy because obviously that commits you to certain things when you do that. So a last check of the dimensions, our Z dimensions, 10 centimeters. The other two are six and a half, so that's fine. You can see we've got a texture on there. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. We'll obviously spend a lot more time on it. And we're really ready to go. So with the object selected, you can either use the, if you have them enabled in preferences, you can use the 3D printing tools. One little thing that you will need to check with some printouts, I'm fairly confident I won't have a problem with this one, is go to vertex select mode, make sure nothing selected. Press the space bar. If you get this extra dynamic space bar menu, which I've got enabled, then you'll need to click search. But if you don't have that enabled, it should come straight to this. And start typing non. And what you should get come up is select non-manifold. Click that. You need this number up here next to verts to be zero, which it is in my case. If anything's selected, it'll have a number in there. And that basically means faces that don't quite work. You may have three faces coming together, which means that the printer won't understand which is outside, which is inside. Essentially, you have to imagine your model as something which can contain water, not in here, in the big void, but between the walls. It has to be sealed, watertight, as they say. You can export the STL here, or what I normally then just do, not in edit mode, is go file, export, STL, and I place an STL file in here. So we'll export that. If it's a large file, it will take a little while. There ends the modeling section. And what I'm gonna go on to next is the slicing section.